Welcome everybody. I'm glad you're all here. I've got 30 some odd participants here with us. Royal Coffee is a green coffee importer. We're based in California in the US. If you're not familiar with our work, we carry coffee from about 30 countries um, in the world. We're a family run independent business, but we're relatively large and we do uh, import and export worldwide. Hi everyone. My name is Alex Giorgio. I'm head of marketing at Akawa um, and uh, really delighted to be here. Ikawa's here to improve coffee and it's our customers and the way our customers use uh, the Ikawa roasters that really makes this difference. So coming together um, to connect, uh, to share knowledge, uh, roast profiles and experiences are a really powerful part of, of that. We developed Ikawa Cup to really um, help make it easier for roasters particularly to cup coffee and record their notes in a, in a kind of purposeful way. The first coffee, it's a Bolivian coffee. This is a pretty atypical Bolivian coffee. It is uh, an anaerobically fermented. Ulysses is located in Carnaby, which is probably one of the premier growing regions of that country. Uh, elevation is super high. Uh, cultivars are mostly legacy, like Tipica. Um, and uh, interestingly, the coffee is relatively low in density. On the other hand, we have this very traditional uh, coffee from Yerga Chefe. It's a true Yerga Chefe, which means that uh, it's not just from the Gideo macro region, but it's actually from the town of Yerga Chefe itself. It is a private washing station called Demerso, and uh, this coffee exhibits typically high density in terms of green coffee readings. I still think that there's a lot you can take away by getting green coffee density readings on your coffees. It's one of the simplest and easiest measurement tools that the roasters have. Uh, it doesn't require sophisticated equipment. We just use a graduated cylinder and a scale and take a couple of measurements and average them. This Ethiopia ranks kind of close to that 690 to 700 range on the manual readings, whereas Ulisa Chambi's Bolivian coffee is down in the kind of below to a little below average. Um, not huge differences in measurement, but I do think that they make a difference when we're talking about roasting styles. Noted some folks already talking a bit about um, acidity and sweetness and body, particularly uh, in the Bolivian coffee. And I think that I agree that the differences in the roasts are much more noticeable in the lower density Bolivian coffee. For me, I was really struck by the brightness and sweetness in the first set, the HD roasts. And uh, conversely, um, in the lower density style of roasting, what I felt was really remarkable was the lushness and how long the experience was. I felt like the body was much improved. The sweetness was similar. The acidity was reduced, I agree. So we missed some of those citric notes. Um, but for me, it has a little bit more of an interesting, long lasting experience, I guess, in flavor profile. For the Ethiopian coffees, the differences are maybe slightly more negligible, and this might be preferential. Um, I tend to, when I think about coffees like this that are really bright and really floral, I, I kind of tend to ignore the body factor on coffees like that. I feel like a heavy bodied coffee with those delicate flavor notes can sometimes be distracting. And I guess for me, for that reason, I prefer the HD style roasts, the first of the two. I feel like it enhances that brightness of the citric acidity really brings out some of those like jasmine and lavender and hibiscus notes. Um, the second set, the lower density roasts style is still very good and probably would be difficult to distinguish if we were to try to triangulate these coffees. But I do feel like there's a little bit of a heaviness there that I guess I could con possibly consider distracting. I've got some good notes rolling in from uh, in the chat there. So if you're not already looking at your colleagues uh, across the uh, world, feel free to chime in there if you haven't and uh, see what other folks are saying. I've tried to select similar coffees in some ways, even though their flavor profiles are relatively different. Moisture and water activity, obviously a factor in screen size as well. So many different things um, impacting the way that coffee roasts beyond density, but I guess my take is that ultimately, ultimately if, you if you know, know nothing, nothing else about, about a coffee other, other than um, perhaps where it's from, how it's processed, and, and the green coffee density, there's a lot that you can 
assume going into an early roast trial period when you're trying to figure out you know your production style for a particular coffee and it's been really easy to do with the akawa because the roast profiles are so repeatable and the scale is small enough that i'm not blowing you know a 90 kg batch on the got hot for example i usually think of high density coffees requiring a lot of extra heat during early stages um, and, and by, by doing, doing that, that we, we sort of set a stage for a different end roast approach as well um, if you think of the density of green coffee kind of like uh, using cooking material in the kitchen, for example, I, I often make the analogy of like cast iron versus stainless steel. A high density coffee is going to take longer like that cast iron to get up to temperature, but once it's there, it holds that energy better. Um, and as a result, as a roaster, you may actually need less heat energy later in the roast using the style that I'm, I guess, kind of recommending or, or just alluding to. Um, as opposed to um, coffees that are of lower densities, which probably are going to require less energy early in the roast. And as a result, you may actually continue have to push those coffees if you're using a manual roaster um, to continue to roast later because you've used less energy in the early stages. Small changes that I've made. The first is the charge temperature. Um, and for the lower density style of uh, roasting in the red line on the graph in front of you, the idea is that because we need less energy up front due to the lower density, we can start with a lower temperature, at least on the Akawa. You know, if you're using a different type of roaster, maybe you use a similar charge temperature, but less gas or heat energy, depending on your roaster type. The second is extending the Maillard phase. And if you, you know, familiar with uh, Rob Foose's work, um, the idea here is that creating complexity, lengthening our sugar chain during, uh, chains during the Maillard reactions uh, can increase uh, complexity of flavor, can increase the perceived viscosity, and uh, increases our kind of like caramelized sweetness, but it may reduce acidity. And so I think of those two principles hand in hand, and I think about the way that many low density coffees express themselves, this Bolivia being a pretty exception, a pretty exceptional example of something that's uncommon in lower density coffees, which is a, a real vibrancy and complexity regardless of roasting style. But even I think in this lower density style of roasting, we can even enhance that more. You can you can really kind of tease that out of the coffee. Whereas this Ethiopia naturally has that inherent high acidity, the inherent florality and complexity, and doesn't really need the roaster to kind of caress it through the Maillard reactions. Instead, we can really use the roaster as a tool to get us to the late stages in roasting and then really kind of hang back at the very end, let the coffee coast a bit. Um, and if you enjoy lighter styles of roasting like these, um, ideally the coffee kind of expresses itself without a whole lot of extra management during the early roasting stages other than to give it as much heat as it requires. I take it from that, Chris, that you're a, a development time person rather than TTR. <laughs> I am, yeah, I'm a time guy. Um, <laughs> time over temperature, time over DTR, for sure. Uh, I know this is, can be controversial. I actually put a poll out not too long ago on my Instagram to see if folks had opinions on this, and the majority are definitely temperature people at the end of the roast. But I think for me, if I'm watching things like, you know, on the Akawa you have the inlet temperature uh, and on my Diedrich I've got that exhaust uh, thermocouple and, and those give me additional pieces of information about like where my roast is going and how fast it's going to get there. And if I'm paying attention to that and if I'm looking at, the, you know, I'm, I'm also a roast color guy. I, I learned to roast by eyesight um, early in my career. And so if I'm paying attention to things like time of development and color, I can usually make decisions that I feel like are the most informed for me. I know that not everyone roasts that way and I'm not necessarily recommending that for everybody, but for me it works.